spoiler alert! In this video, we're looking at a book that's almost nothing but spoilers, as it covers the ending of over a hundred video games. This is The NES Endings Compendium, years 1985 to 1988, by Ray Esteban. Hey everyone, John here. As you know, I've looked at a few different books about the Nintendo Entertainment System and its whole library, and there are still a couple more I plan to review, as of the time of making this video. But there's one thing that might be more impressive than just writing overviews of every NES game, which is already a feat. Ray Esteban, who you may know from VGMuseum.com, a wonderful online repository of screenshots, takes it a step further by playing and finishing every NES game that can be finished, so you can see and read about them in this series of books. Plus, there are sometimes multiple endings, and though many endings are cool, hence the existence of this book, many other endings are anticlimactic, especially considering the level of challenge common in this era of games. So, let's get into this book, and appreciate all of these NES games that Ray survived. This book is called The NES Endings Compendium, years 1985 to 1988. Well, the front cover says, The Original NES Endings Compendium, like a few of the early NES games that were first in arcades, including Mario Brothers, the Donkey Kong series, and Popeye. And the whole book cover for this volume evokes the classic style of those original black box games. This is the first of a series that will eventually look at the endings of every NES game in roughly chronological order. This volume covers the first few years, from the first Super Mario Brothers in 1985 to 1988 which includes its sequel. 1989 was quite busy for the NES, so the next book will be about games released in only that one year, which promises to be exciting, considering the popular games that came out in those particular 12 months. While all North American games are or intended to be covered in this series, Japanese Famicom games are only featured when they have a North American counterpart and with notable differences. Localization efforts at this time often change games considerably, altering not just titles and character names, but entire stories, including the endings. Therefore, even the most accomplished NES players are likely to see something new, unless they are also Famicom enthusiasts. So, there are 105 North American NES games from 1985 to 1988 featured here in this first book. You could add two more games if you consider Mike Tyson's Punch-Out and the later release of Just Punch-Out as different games, and World Class Track Meet apart from the extremely rare Stadium Events, so that's 107 or 123 in total if you count 16 regional variants as separate. These regional variants include 15 Famicom games, which in turn include two Japanese versions of Gradius, and then in addition to these, there is a European version of Contra as well. If you count by cartridges, you could add four more. The games compiled in Donkey Kong Classics and the Action Set and Power Set bundles are all covered within these years. The 1993 Namco release of their own Pac-Man game is identical to the 1988 Tengen release. Tengen is known for their unlicensed NES games, and we're only considering licensed games here, but Tengen's Pac-Man is one of the few Tengen games that came in both unlicensed and licensed versions. The other ones are Gauntlet and RBI Baseball, which are included in the original count of 105. 46 other games in this early period do not have endings, but mention as such for the sake of completion, for a grand total of 151 distinct games mentioned in this book, or 169 if you count every alternate and regional version. Altogether, there are 123 endings, or 155 if you include the regional variants, though that number is very easily contested, as you might not consider endings of the regional variants as more endings. Or, perhaps you'd just consider them pluses, sort of like the 19 games that are said to have 1 plus or 2 plus endings, with the plus referring to minor variations to endings that don't each count as full additional endings. However you want to count them, at the very least, you've still got over 100 games with over 120 endings to look at here. How many people can say they have finished 100 NES games? So let's take a look here. The book has these games listed roughly chronologically, that is, just by their calendar year. But for readers who don't have an idea when a game came out, which I imagine is probably most people, thankfully the table of contents is in alphabetical order. This prefers in-game titles as opposed to how they appear on the box. Therefore, we have the 3D Battles of World Runner instead of 3D World Runner, and Zanuck AI instead of Zanuck without the AI. These endings are presented with screenshots and text, adorned with sprites and speech bubbles and boxes and borders. As explained in the preface, Esteban modeled this book after game magazines like Nintendo Power and Electronic Gaming Monthly as they would have looked at the time, and I would say that style is pretty much nailed down. The header info box shows a title screenshot and mentions the publisher and developer, Pretty standard for the sort of books I've reviewed on this channel, but here specifically it has number of endings and an ending rating. For early NES games that have an ending at all, they might just have one, or one plus, 
which as mentioned is just one distinct ending with possible variations. But there are a few with multiple endings, like 5 each for Metroid and Kid Icarus. Then, the ending rating is Esteban's score from 0 to 5 stars. In this particular volume, any whole number of stars in this entire range is here, but the majority of endings get just 1 or 2 stars. There's only one with 4 stars, Super Mario Bros. 2, and a singular game with a 5 star rating, Bionic Commando. Sure, why not, it's certainly memorable. As the stories of NES games get more elaborate over time, we can hopefully expect future books to cover more games that have multiple endings, as well as a higher average rating. There are some Famicom equivalents worth mentioning, so a regional corner subsection is featured with some of these games. Dragon Power, originally a Dragon Ball game, doesn't specifically have a regional corner, but still thoroughly explains the differences in localization, with both North American and Japanese screenshots. Sometimes the difference is minor, like Adventure Island originally having just an additional line of text, or Karnov, where the difference is major, comparing the poor excuse of an ending in the North American version to the Famicom's fleshed out story with multiple endings, which are unsurprisingly cut due to having religious references. But to understand the endings, we need to know the context, so the premise is often also provided, or a story recap, though the endings are, of course, the focal point and have the most detail and images. As stated explicitly in the preface, all information is either directly from the game or else from the original game manuals. Lore developed and refined over time in sequels, remakes, or other media is not mentioned, and anything in the original games or manuals that may have since been ignored, corrected, or retconned after the original release of these games is still fair game to mention for the purposes of this book. For example, according to the manual for Super Mario Bros., the Koopa tribe's black magic turned the mushroom people into various objects, including bricks. The princess can reverse this magic, but until she is saved, Mario smashes through lots of bricks. I mean, that's pretty much his thing. Murderer! On the same point, Mega Man was created by Dr. Wright, as stated in the original manual, instead of Dr. Light as we know him now. They reside in Monsteropolis, a city name we never hear in the series again, and Mega Man is supposedly the first human-like robot. His older brother, Proto Man, won't be revealed until Mega Man 3. So for the original game's premise, Mega Man is considered the first. Also, Sam's Aaron, the protagonist of Metroid, is twice referred to as a he, until the very end of course. This colludes with the first game's manual, where Samus is explicitly described to be male, to throw everyone off. Of course, since this book is all about endings, we will see the truth, at least if you took less than 5 hours. And that is one of the great things about this book. Clearly describing the specific conditions to see each of the multiple endings for those games that have more than one. It's helpful, like Nintendo Power, but even better if you don't mind spoilers, as Nintendo Power would usually stop short of revealing the end of games. I mean, it makes sense that Nintendo Power wouldn't want to spoil games in their magazine previews, but hey, you're looking at this book because you want to know about endings, so here you go. Even so, I shouldn't spoil this book entirely, but here's a sampling of endings that I think are neat. Despite Gradius having one North American ending, in Japan it has multiple, with a different ending message for each loop through the whole game. More amusingly, there is another Japanese version that promotes the Archimedes brand of instant ramen noodles. Space shooting and eating noodles. What a combination. Castlevania's credits list the supposed cast, as if the various monsters were played by actors. These names are actually based on the names of actors in horror films of the early to mid 20th century. The director, writer, and composer are references as well, all explained here. It's interesting trivia that goes beyond just seeing screenshots. The pages for Mike Tyson's Punch-Out have a newspaper look, just like the newspaper segments within the game. This newspaper has articles seemingly written by Nestor Howard and Hester Phillips, which are references to Nintendo's Game Master Howard Phillips and his fictional pal Nestor, both seen in Nintendo Power's Howard and Nestor comic. Hester refers to Nestor's seldomly seen twin sister. There are some other Punch-Out references here too. Blaster Master is one of those games that has an entirely different story depending on the region. While here in the West, we see the protagonist Jason blasting through hordes of underground mutants, supposedly, or at least initially, in pursuit of Fred, his runaway pet frog, there is no such pet in the Japanese version since the story is entirely different, being a space opera in a different time and place with totally different characters. Bubble Bobble is a great example of a game with multiple endings and how to achieve them, including passwords that can get you to certain points to achieve them. Contra's Regional Corner explains how the Japanese version actually keeps track of your consecutive playthroughs by adding flags that appear on a helicopter in a scene not featured in the North American version. Plus, there's a code to be entered during the credits that reviews a secret message. Also, Contra is the only game in this volume to also feature its European version. In this case, it is known as Probotector and features robots, and the end has an escape on a futuristic jet instead of a helicopter. 
Double Dragon has an unused room seen by a glitch in a beta version, and an unused credit sequence in the code of the retail version. I wonder if we'll see more hidden or unused ending bits and pieces in later volumes. So, 35 popular games, or 36 if you count the punch out separately, plus 14 international counterparts appear in the main yearly sections, usually with 1, 2, or 4 pages. The exceptions are two of the Donkey Kong games, with just half a page each, and Bionic Commando, which not only has the highest rating of 5 stars, but also the most coverage with 6 pages, even though there is just one ending to that game. Gotta give space to that rare occurrence of gore in an NES game, as the head of Hitler, I mean Master D, explodes in a bloody mess. The Ending Cottage, which appears at the tail end of each yearly segment, showcases 55 other games. Or 56 if you count World Class Track Meet and Stadium Events as separate, plus two Famicom versions that have simpler brief endings that can be summed up succinctly, usually in less than a page. In Othello's case, no description is necessary. The ending for 1942 is barely anything, so instead of a description, it has quotes from people whose names parody actual game journalists. How many do you recognize? Paperboy and Superman are small enough to be covered here, even with regional variation included. After all of the yearly sections is The Endless Pit, which features 15 games that don't have conventional endings, even if they do have narrative progression or final bosses. Though I don't really get how these, especially the first few just vaguely described as loose endings, couldn't still have been included in The Ending Cottage instead, which would have kept all the games from the same release years together. The last page of The Endless Pit lists 46 games that truly are endless, with nothing resembling progress or finale at all. There's a mail call feature with personal experiences of NES game endings recalled by key people in the video game scene. This includes a write-up from yours truly about the first NES game my brother finished, Super Mario Bros. 2. Then there's a preview of the 1989 compendium. Ninja Gaiden, Dragon Warrior, and Mega Man 2? Yes, please. This ending book concludes with some acknowledgements. There's my name between Jeremy Parrish's and Ken Logs, which is quite an honor. And my site, vgmaps.com and the Video Game Atlas, gets a shout out as well. While we're acknowledging things, this is indeed the first book I've ever received directly from the author, specifically for review purposes. So thank you, Mr. Ray Esteban, for being the first to send me something. I guess that now makes me a legitimate book reviewer. To be clear, he has explicitly said that I do not need to hold back. Not that I would review things without being able to speak my mind honestly, to maintain credibility. So let's take a look at the great bits and the not so great bits. Flipping through this really does feel like a magazine, certainly the soft cover one, and that Nintendo Power style is spot on. It certainly makes each page of the main section look unique and fresh. You can tell there was care in the design for backgrounds and borders and the layout of various elements. And you know, lots and lots of screenshots and sprites. I like the little touches, like the lineup of items on the first pages for Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest and Metal Gear, the title screen and character select style borders for Super Mario Bros. 2, and the comic-like arrangement of the ending sequence of the 3D battles of World Runner. Speech bubbles are common, and sometimes there are bits of official art from the manuals. It's a colorful book, packed with images, yet never really feeling cluttered. It just looks great, in that charming retro way. As for the content, well, it is what the title says what it is, a compendium of NES endings. For many games, there is also a fair bit of recap including the premise and some setup before the ending. Some early NES games don't have much story development during the game, so the first volume isn't too far off from chronicling entire NES stories. This might not be the case moving forward, given that RPGs and the likes of cutscene-heavy Ninja Gaiden are on the horizon, but I guess anything more than the ending could be considered a bonus. The Goonies 2 coverage even talks extensively about the first Goonies game, even though that didn't come out on an NES cartridge in North America. But if you want endings, you've certainly got them, so there's no complaint here. I love that games with multiple endings have their conditions explained. I guess that would probably be a given as it's kind of hard to talk about good and bad endings without mentioning what the requirements are for each of them, so you can even refer to this as a guide when playing a game. Now I certainly know a lot more about NES games than Famicom games, so I am impressed with and learn much from the regional corner. There are some regional differences in popular games that I've long known about, but I didn't know much about endings, like that Konami expects some players to finish Gradius and Contra six times consecutively, or Life Force with as few continues as possible, or that the worst ending of Kid Icarus has an ungrateful Palutena turning Pit into a speck nose. Kudos to Esteban for researching and including these counterparts in Japanese. Speaking of language, I thankfully don't need to act like an angry English teacher for this review, as this book is overall well written. Any spelling or grammar errors in this book are more likely to be within the screenshots of the games. After all, the biggest NES game developers are Japanese, and maybe their localization teams just didn't bother to spell check. 
So you'll see odd sentences you might refer to as Japanglish or English, like Your all mission is all over. You're a great player. This game was ended. Or Be nice, everyone. A singular congratulation. That sort of thing. They actually add a certain charm to this era of games. Obviously, these are in the games themselves, and definitely not erroneous of this book to report things as they are. The congratulations on the final page is surely a deliberate English reference, and not a careless misspelling. Words aren't the issue here, but perhaps numbers. Metroid's endings are a little confusing. The way it is written, it doesn't say what happens if you finish between 2 to 3 hours, 4 to 5 hours, or 9 to 10 hours. Less than 1 hour really should say less than 1 hour, or 0 to 1 hour, because as it is, it looks like negative 1 hour. Games are featured in The Endless Pit because they have an unconventional ending, or barely a hint of an ending, but I don't think they warrant segregation from the yearly ending cottage sections. Some aren't that different. Surely the end of a game of Jeopardy or Wheel of Fortune is just as much of an ending as the finale of Lunar Pool. And how does 1942, whose ending is congratulations with a score and a percentage, better than Tennis, whose ending is congratulations with a dollar amount and an image of a trophy? Yet 1942 escapes the endless pit that Tennis is relegated to. And a few that listing games by year instead of alphabetically, while not as intuitive, is still at least logical, but putting these games in the endless pit segment at the end disrupts that order, mixing the games up more than is necessary. Good thing the table of contents is alphabetical, which partially counters this. The number of endings could be more clear and consistent. In addition to its one western ending, Gradius is said to have seven Japanese endings, but one is for the promotional Archimedes Ramen Noodle brand, the other six endings for the regular Japanese version are differentiated by just a line or two of text that changes per loop. Do these truly constitute different endings? And if so, shouldn't that be consistent across all games? Gunsmoke is also different by only a line of text, and yet the number of endings for that is just 1+. plus. I feel like that should actually say 2 if text is enough to make a difference, and also include the 3 for the Famicom version, unless there's some logic here that I missed. And then something like Blaster Master, where the regional versions are so different, should say one ending but one for each, not one overall. If the text in Gradius makes Japan worth mentioning in the number of endings box, then certainly Blaster Master, or rather Chu Wakase Senki Metaphyte, with his differently shaped fortress and character portraits, seems like it would be worth mentioning in the ending count too, even if it is the same number. Now, even though I think number of endings in the header or info box really should be less ambiguous, this doesn't impact the actual information that has been provided about the endings but I definitely noticed it when I was simply trying to count the endings, and surely got confused, so if you also happen to count them, you may come up with a different number than the 155 that I got. Since I'm used to reading entire encyclopedias of games, I initially thought that listing games chronologically, or rather by year, would be a negative, but now I'm not so sure. When this series is complete, it will certainly be neat to see how the endings evolve, from the mostly endless arcade-style black box games in 1985, to an adventure from 1994 like Zoda's Revenge Star Tropics 2. Though we see some of that here in this first volume that covers three years and two and a half months. However, the number of playable NES games will skyrocket. 1988 makes up half of this volume, and we already know that 1989 alone is enough for a whole book, so this whole series will certainly end up being multiple volumes. Though it is sort of nice to have small, magazine-sized books to read, compared to some of the massive tomes you've seen me review, and later ones will have different cover designs, I would still be interested to see a complete compendium of all of the endings in one huge volume. I guess we'll see when we get there. But for now, I really dig this first volume. I give this a 4.5 out of 5. As a fun, easy to read, and definitely unique book about NES games, this is easy to recommend to fans of 8-bit Nintendo. Whether you're a casual gamer wanting to see endings of games that may otherwise forever elude you, or a pro NES game master confirming if you've accomplished all these endings, or you just want a retro gaming book that won't break the bank or your back, you'll want to pick up the NES Endings Compendium, available from Amazon at the link below or in the description. And you should buy it if you are at all interested to support Ray Esteban, so that we will be more likely to get additional volumes of this intriguing series. So, what are some of the hardest NES games that you have finished? What are some of the best and worst endings that you have achieved? Comment below if you want to discuss. And don't forget to hit that like button and the subscribe button and notification bell if you haven't already, so you'll know when I have more video game book reviews and other fun and geeky video content. Thanks for watching! So keep playing, keep reading, and keep geeking out. See ya. By Ray Esteban. <laughs> oh my goodness, Jay. So we're, we're right at the end! That was that. Okay. You know, I held it for a couple seconds. I thought I, I did really... Okay, alright. Alright, okay. okay. One for the blooper reel. I mean, that's pretty much his thing.
Murderer! 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 Rewind. It's going for the blooper reel. Murderer! 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 <laughs> that sounds weird to me. Okay, rewind. You've made it to the end of this video, so congratulations! Or should I say, congratulations! Click on the upcoming thumbnails to begin a new video.